<laughs> Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for being here. Welcome to the library. My name is Kevin Darling. I'm one of the librarians for the Hormel LGBTQIA Center, and I am excited to be here with you all this afternoon to get to watch this special sneak peek of Sally, a documentary film in progress, and to hear from our amazing panel of Sally Gearhart's friends and colleagues. I have just a couple of announcements, and we will begin with a land acknowledgement. This is Ohlone land. The San Francisco Public Library acknowledges that we occupy the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramutish Ohlone peoples, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. We recognize that we are the uninvited guests and we affirm their sovereign rights as first peoples and wish to pay our respects to the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramutish community. I would like to invite you all to join us Wednesday, July 26th at 6 p.m. in the Hormel Center on the third floor for the event Show Us Your Spines. Six queer and trans BIPOC artists and writers present work inspired by the Hormel Center's archive and book collections following their six-week residency with the library. Please sign up for our monthly e-newsletter e to find out about new LGBTQIA events happening each month at the library. And there is a sign-up sheet for that at the back table. And now I would like to introduce the director of Sally, Deborah Craig. Deborah is an award-winning documentary director and producer. Deborah's most recent short, A Great Ride, a 33-minute documentary about lesbians and aging, premiered at the Frameline Film Festival in 2018. Deborah currently teaches at San Francisco State University, as Sally Gearhart did. And I will let Deborah take it from here and introduce the rest of our panel. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Kevin. And um, I really appreciate seeing all your, your faces out there and so many familiar faces and some I don't know yet. Um, I just wanted to quickly tell you uh, 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 the sort of sequence of events is that um, we will be, um, this will be a panel discussion interspersed with clips from the Sally film. This is a work in progress. Um, and um, so um, we are getting there. We're not there yet. So, um, you know, feedback is welcome, but we're looking forward to the time when we can have you back and show the full film. Um, so in, in addition to interspersing uh, clips of Sally and the film in progress with some discussion with our, 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 our really um, accomplished panelists, um, we really want to focus on both showing Sally's past accomplishments and her contemporary relevance, which I feel like uh, is every day I read the news and I think we need that spirit, we need that um, that kind of a, a warrior spirit now of fighting for justice now more than ever. Um, I want to, uh, I'm going to, Ruth is, uh, is kind of my partner in crime here in, in uh, keeping us uh, 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 in keeping us all on track as best as possible. So I'm going to do some introductions and, and she's going to do that as well. Um, um, I, I, I really have the, the great fortune of having been able to, to met and work with Cherie Moraga in this project. Cherie um, was a, a, a student of Sally's and also is now an internationally known, uh, recognized poet, essayist, and playwright. Um, her career began in 1981 when she co-edited uh, the groundbreaking feminist anthology, This Bridge Called My Back, which I think has been taught in, in probably hundreds, if not thousands, of classes since then. She's the author of many other works, including a Chicana Codex of Changing Consciousness, Waiting in the Wings, Portrait of Queer Motherhood, and Native Country of the Heart, among other works. Um, and this August, her 1983 collection, Loving in the Warriors, will be reissued um, by Haymarket Press of Chicago. She's also currently a distinguished professor in the Department of English uh, uh, at UC Santa Barbara. And with her uh, artistic partner, Celia Herrera Rodriguez, she founded La Maestra Center for Chicana Indigenous Thought, Art, and Social Practice. Um, Ruth is going to carry me. And... We also have Jewel Gomez. Um, Jewel is a playwright, novelist, poet, and activist. 
Um, she is the former director of the San Francisco State University Poetry Center, American Poetry Archives, and a former president of the San Francisco Library Commission. Yay. <laughs> uh, among many other places that she has guided through hard times. So thank you for all of that. Um, she was recently the subject of a documentary called Jewel, A Just Vision, which is fabulous. If you haven't seen it, you must. It's wonderful, so thank you. And a friend, and a friend of Sally's, so. Uh, and also I wanna um, uh, introduce Ruth Mahaney to you. She taught LGBT history at City College of San Francisco for over 35 years, was a member of the Modern Times Bookstore, collective for 35 years. She's lived in San Francisco since 1971. Uh, she met uh, Sally Gearhart in 1971, um, which seems like a, an amazing accomplishment until you find out I've met people who knew Sally since 1948. <laughs> so she has a good record, but not the winning record. Um, as she and Sally both sought at SF State and both were members of the Lesbian Caucus, a group of lesbian activists attempting to advocate for lesbian rights with city government. Um, I also want to give an acknowledgement to the fact that we have some many incredible luminaries in the audience. And if I went to describe each one of them, we would run out of time to do our panel. But just a shout out to uh, Midget, to Rink Photo, to Roma Guy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's just some, um, in the, I think to me what I've come away in the process of making this film is we have a room here full of people who we should be making films about. Um, I don't know how we're gonna get the money to do it, but I'll figure that out later, okay? So in terms of introduction, so I said we're inter in interspersing with clips. The first clip we're gonna show is a, a, a trailer to our film. So apologies to those of you who have already seen it. If you haven't seen it, or even if you have, this is our introduction to Sally. Um, so, so that was Sally at about 83 or 84. So um, I'm aiming for that. Uh, one thing I forgot to say before we showed the clip is uh, this is a work in progress and so um, many of the f photos and film clips in, uh, that we have in here, we have not gotten permissions yet, but we were working on getting permission to those and so that's one reason that this end is being recorded, but uh, the clips will not be being shown, but just a heads up on that. Um, but now uh, I, I wanted to turn to the panelists and ask them my first question, which is uh, what is the number one impact that Sally had on you? And I think, Cherie, um, you had something that you wanted to read, and so why don't we, we hand it over to you? which is called my back. Um, I decided to read this because I think it says it best in answer to that question. Sally Miller Gellerhart, the lesbian feminist activist and the author of Wonderground, was actually the first to recommend Bridge to Persephone Press, which was the press that published the book. I skip a lot and I talk about other influences. And then, more personally, what is not known about the history of Bridge is the role the book played in my own evolution as a student and a public thinker. Perhaps I speak of it here for the students who hunger for that life of the mind, to go public, to create actual testifiable change in one's life. During the summer of 1980, when I went east to find a publisher for Bridge, I was completing coursework in a special master's program in feminist writings at SFSU. Under the generous tutelage of Sally Gearhart and her then partner, English professor Jane Gurko, I had designed my own program. There were no graduate studies programs in women's studies at the time. Upon my return, I was due to write my thesis, but when I came back from Boston, I came back changed. 
I had already come to realize that the project of bridge had not only taken over my life, but also my life purpose. A standard master's thesis was no longer viable, and I made my case to my advisors. Within the context of the late 1970s, utterly white middle class dominated genre of feminist writings, medi mediating my, by, by white instructors, Bridge was a logical and necessary critical outcome to my feminist studies. The book was an enormous collective fill in the blank of so much that had been missing in my education. It was what never appeared on a reading list. Its labor was my thesis. And my true teachers, Jane and Sally, concurred with a 10-page paper to justify the project. This bridge called my back, Writings by Radical Women of Color, became my R Woman of Color thesis, stacked somewhere in manuscript form on the library shelves of SFSU. I honor Jane and Sally as models of an old school feminist teaching practice where professors were willing to break the rules to allow their students a change of mind. I've been meaning to thank those two women in print for 35 years. I, I think sometimes we don't know what a particular period is, is giving us. And I think that was true of the 70s, while you're in it. Um, you know, it was the time of Title IX. Um, it was uh, Roe v. Wade. And there was also, I just was reading up on this, and I, I saw that the Supreme Court actually um, struck down rules against women being on juries in the 70s. So some states had those as rules. And so all of that to say is like this room that has all of these activists in it, the 70s were like that. Everything was bubbling up. Things were happening all across the country. And one of the things that happened for me was uh, getting uh, a free ticket to see a special screening of Word Is Out in '79 uh, or '7, I guess. And that was the film itself was just so uh, stunning for me. I saw my first black lesbian, Achebe Powell. Uh, who just left us recently, but I saw Sally. And the thing about Sally for me was she had all of the elements that I thought I would have sometime. You know, she was a writer, she was politically active, she was a teacher at a university, and she had that voice. Um, so when I saw that, I thought, that's, there's a possibility for me in the future, professionally, politically, and personally, just her embodiment of all the things I thought I would grow up to be. Um, and my great regret was by the time I got to work at San Francisco State, she had retired. So, you know, I just kind of wandered the hall seeing if I could catch her scent. <laughs> um. I, I had a really hard time figuring out one. You said the, oh, yeah, yeah. the number I one. <laughs> I was like, we have the library until 8 p.m. So yeah, <laughs> sorry, we, we're not here till 8 p.m. So I thought I'd talk about um, her her connection to trees and animals. <laughs> um, so Sally and I um, used to. Sally would be invited to do lectures at various places, and she sometimes took me with her. And we would sit on stage and um, sort of talk about feminism, and but disagree with each other. So um, it was uh, I was the Marxist feminist, and or the socialist feminist, or something like that. And uh, she was the cultural feminist, and um, so we would 
proceed to argue with each other on stage. And it was fun because the audience would get really freaked out and want to like make peace between us. And they would, you know, <laughs> question and answers, they would, you know, come up with some way to unite us and make us friends again, you know, which was never really a problem. Um, but I, but she did bring up things that I often didn't bring up. I remember her bringing up um, experimentation on animals at San Francisco State. And she came totally freaked out one day to a meeting that she had gotten the vibes of the animals speaking to her as she was walking past the building where animals were caged. And they were screaming to her to save them, and she was going to have to do that. Um, I'm not, I think she may have tried at some point to release, or someone did, to release animals from cages at state. But, um, and just before she died, um, I went up to visit her, and um, we were sitting out in front of her little room there. Um, she was no longer on the land. She had been, we moved her to um, Ukiah, and, um, but there was a huge tree in front, and um, she told me that the tree had been, they'd been having a conversation, and that the tree um, told her it was okay to go, and um, the tree was having a hard time being in the city because there was traffic going back and forth, and she was worried about the tree, um, but that the tree had told her that um, it was okay for her to go. So, so I think about sort of trying to remember to bring those things into my socialist whatever I think I'm doing. So. Uh, thank you all for those, those, yeah. I, I think you see already Sally with so many different things and that's what we really hope for the, the film to show. Um, and Jean Crosby's not here, but we have her saying, I think trees might have been more important to Sally than people. <laughs> um, so, um, we are, uh, you know, in our film, we hope to uh, celebrate Sally's accomplishments, and there are many of them. But Sally was a complicated person and a very, very many faceted person. And um, I don't, didn't have the advantage of knowing her from back in the 70s. Um, and so I was just, I met her in 2014, and it, it sort of felt like every time I visited her, I learned something completely new. Um, and I, I wanted to really make extra sure that that's reflected in the film, her complexities and some of the challenges she faces, whether it's intellectual challenges or life challenges. Um, and so what the next thing, clip we're gonna show is a clip on separatism. Um, yeah, Sally was pretty funny, huh? Um, so we are, are going to look uh, uh, at some of the positives and maybe the challenges also that came with separatism in the film itself. And maybe that clip looked more at some of the you know, you know, need for separatism. But again, in the interest of bringing the, the, the dialogue back to what's happening today where um, in some, some ways it feels like we're maybe backsliding. I guess my question is, um, do we have a renewed need for some kind of separatism today? If any, any, any of you have thoughts on that. Well. You leaned in. So. I did lean in. <laughs> <laughs> well, as one of the um, interviewees said, I, I, I think it's less about separatism and I think that has always skewed the conversation because it's kind of like a reaction to the male-dominated culture. And I don't have a new word yet. As a good feminist, I, I should, but I'll work on it. Um, there's, it's more about, as Sally said, wanting to be in the company of other women and figuring out you know, how we reflect each other and then strengthen each other, I think is more the point. And I think that's always gonna be needed. It's gonna be needed for any 
cultural group that has been oppressed or dominated by another cultural group to find each other, to reinforce each other um, is vital before we can reach out and make coalitions, which I do think are possible. Um, so I would rather be emphasizing the positive aspect of women connecting with women to reinforce, reexamine, uh, reify our, uh, our value, um, rather than have it be a reactionary thing of let's lock men away from us. It's more like let's get together with each other. I think it's, it's so, of course, um, the trick with separatism is that you were separating from your, um, within the context of your own familias. It made it very painful. Um, and on one level, it required a huge amount of courage. Um, and it also um, made it very difficult, as you already said, Jewel, about um, cutting off your families of color or anybody that felt um, particularly strong relations with their family. And at the same time, it exposed that our, many of our families are actually the site of the first knowledge of, of, of being oppressed, um, particularly as women. The double standards, incest, sexual violence, all of that. So like we were saying earlier, I feel like that the, the movement was really important. Um, ironically, the kind of where your brain, where my brain has gone in recent years, and I was just talking with my partner today, and we're driving over, um, and I was trying. I would say, why is it that I was talking particularly about Mexicans, um, but then we would start. I said, yeah, but in Africa, and then we're going to all these places, right? I, I almost feel like the, the, the visceral relationship to misogyny is greater than ever, that I feel it on the daily. And all my feminism, 40 years of feminism or more, I feel it almost more viscerally now, because I'm 70, and I saw what happened in those 40 years that I had thought initially was so progressive, and that I thought, you know, I thought we, healthily got through separatism, you know, but then it became neoliberal. And we can go on and on. Like we could do the whole analysis of really what happened in many ways that sabotaged the women's movement. And, and so as long as something stays radical, you got an agitation going that's really important. And so um, there's a place for that. There remains a place for that. Because what also what keeps there's nobody like you were saying, saying was just Cornell you know Cornell showing up he may not be the man we want but he at least kind of moves the argument you know a little far farther to the left since now the right the, the Democrats are the right so I say all of this because I I I feel like when you're asking what about now we need feminism more than ever. We also need not to have such an assimilationist view of what it is to be queer. Mm. And that's what we get from trans folk. Not all trans folk, but some very, very radical trans folk, and usually those are trans women of color. So what we're looking for, we all have to be looking for, is that how do we stay radical even at our respective ages, wherever we are? And that, so, so yes, so I look at the things that make me uncomfortable. Even, I'll tell you, even seeing all those women like that still makes me uncomfortable. Not because I don't love my body and love women's bodies, but because I always was like, oh, cleavage is really good. I really like cleavage, and you have all that exposed, <laughs> there's no cleavage. But I was very, un <laughs> very uncomfortable in the first uh, Michigan Women's Festival that I went to. I just said, this. <laughs> So it's different, people have different senses of what's sexy, right? And also that's the great gift of Sally, right? She's a little too much for me. <laughs> but she'd always tell me, she'd always, you know, confide and, you know, what do you think about this, what do you think about that, you know? 
And I always thought we, you know, back in the day in New York, I thought we were really we're like cutting edge, you know, like cutting edge sexual people. And But anyway, all that's to say is that I do feel it's needed more than ever. However we decide, that is. And sometimes I have said that some of the most radical feminists I know, you know, are um, older heterosexual women of color. And I'm saying that because they're at it. They have already been um, disvalued, unnamed, you know, poor. I mean, all of that. I mean, I'm making really big general statements right now because they're agitating, right? And I just want to do that because it. So my thing about what where we have to be at now, that whatever wherever you see that radical spot is, and it agitates you, that's where we need to go, because I always then have to check my stuff and say why. Is this other sister who's another Chicana lesbian just like me? And I said, no, she's like pure neoliberal. That's not my ally. But that, you know, like that African American heterosexual, no longer actively heterosexual, because who can handle that for that long? <laughs> no, I'm saying, I'm talking about older, older, right? And, I, and she got the, you know, I'm saying, I'm using these as, you know, as these uh, representatives. So all of it is very complex, and that's what I loved about Sally. We fought too, but she was radical. She was radical. It's the perfect name for her. And that being too much, I think, is what where the va a lot of the value is, mm -hmm. um, because we we need to go a step out in order to make any kind of social change, to make people even notice they need change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, somebody was talking about Phyllis and Dell when they were making the film about Phyllis and Dell, and somebody said, "Oh my God, Dell, she's so, she's so annoying. She's like, oh, oh my God," <laughs> and it's like she had to be in order to make social change. Mm -hmm. If she was just a nice young lady, nobody was going to listen to her. So, I think that being too much, having to go to the far side and embrace all the women you could and find yourself, I do think is still important. And I think it's important for every, every group. You know, and I think the trans movement has really challenged feminists to really think, well, what do you believe in in feminism? How does your feminism fit today? And the young people who are coming up with a totally different uh, culture and aesthetic. And the thing about feminism is it's always growing. I mean, it started out as very white and middle class. It didn't stay that way that long, but it did start out from an, a place that was unfamiliar to most of us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think we're still evolving what feminism means, and that includes how we think about separatism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Ruth, do you have, do we have just about a minute before just, we need the next? Just question. my only thing is that um, I feel like a lot of us are really scared right now, um, that so much we're under attack. And, and so the temptation is to put aside the differences we have with those that we can unite with at all to fight what is, seems like such a bigger enemy. Um, and, and somehow we have to figure out and remember to still have those arguments with each other, but not reject each other, you know, not like throw each other out and say, okay, you can't be here. And the, I feel like that's the challenge ahead of us now is the separatism and that mindset for us needs to still be there, um, but we also really need to be uniting with all kinds of people right now because mm -hmm. it, it's scary out there. Yeah. Yeah, um, that's a great segue to this next clip because what I wanted to say is that, um, you know, again, Sally was always sort of a puzzle to me. And as Ruth said, there's always, Sally could always see at least two sides, if not many more. Um, so Sally did sometimes identify as a separatist and make some very radical statements. I think the most famous of which is we should reduce men to 10% of the population, which, <laughs> which for some reason didn't go over that well in some 
it, some some crowds and uh, you know again it's a it's it's a wake a way of waking people up whether you agree or not agree it's a way of looking at it and saying this what's happening now is not working and being so very radical and willing to go to the extremes and Sally had another side um, and um, you know, for want of a better word, and making this film, we're calling it, we're just talking about it as reaching across the aisle. So this next clip will show Sally uh, really and her connections with her Willits community. And, and again, I think it ties in so nicely to what we've talked about is we need to find a new feminism, we need to be radical, and we need to, you know, connect with people who are different from us and love one another. And um, Sally shows this, I think, so beautifully. So. Um, the next clip would be great. Thank you. So, either of you want to talk about Sally's reaching across the aisle, or however you want to talk about it? Do I have to talk about that? <laughs> okay. All right. Talk about something else if you would rather. Yeah. Always optional. I guess I just, you know, she's just, um, the, the word, word that keeps coming to me is courage, you know. She's someone that had such tremendous amount of courage, and I, just like you, Jewel, the first time I saw her was in, um, the word is out. That's all I needed to see. And I went down to San Francisco State, I went looking for her, and I, I first, I found, well, I w had been in, had a BA in English, so I went um, to Jane Gurkle because she was in English. And I knew, like, I knew that Jane was, I don't know, I'm, just, I'm not sure how I knew that, but that Jane was with Sally. And I went there and then I said, I want to do this major, I mean, this master's degree. Because I'd been reading, there was, I'd just been reading and reading and reading, trying to find lesbian literature, all this stuff. And, and there was nothing. Um, and what I found was, often was quite alienating to me, but I was hungry, hungry, hungry. And I, so I go to Jane and I tell her, and I, she goes, I go, is there a way I can, what can I do? She goes, well, we don't have a feminist studies master's. And then um, she said, uh, but maybe you can design your own program. I go, sure, <laughs> okay. And those are good old days. But the, I'm saying this story because then she says, so, but wait a minute, you have to meet um, my, my uh, Sally Gearhart, and I'm going, that was it, that was it. I mean, that's what I had gone to Jane for, and the two of them I worked with. But what I want to say is that, that I think, you know, we had moments, many, many years, right after this period of time, and I went back and I taught at San Francisco State, and then she had gone up, and it was those days, it was like that, going up to the, to the land and um, you know, having, doing a chainsaw, you know, <laughs> doing all that for the first time. I really loved that she was butch. I mean, you know, <laughs> I don't know what she did in bed. I am not test, you know, I can't testify to that. But, <laughs> but I love, I love that she was butch, mm. and that she made me proud of that. Out of my own internalized homophobia, I have to say, because I thought, man, you'd be a drug addict. You're gonna be sick. You're gonna spend all your time in bars. I mean, I had every bad since the time I was a little kid. It was so significant. I'd already come out, so it wasn't about that. I was ready. I was way out. But I, uh, to have that, the quality of that person and that mo the way she moved, unapologetically, how she sat, unapologetically, all of that. I'll never be that tall, but I wanted to <laughs> <laughs> live up to it. Anyway, I just have to say that 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 for us, I was young, and I go back to New York, and I mean, I, I moved to New York and. I carried that. I had a lot, a lot of resentment against white lesbians and white feminism. It really hurt me, a lot. And, it, and not intentionally, I'm just saying is that the absence was just horrible. You know, to be queer and not see your own people and then to have to go, go find your own. Well, I went to New York, I, boss, I found my people, <laughs> which was beautiful. But I always held um, Sally as that significant juncture in the road, and I think probably most of the people that you would talk to about her, that's what's important, is that she was, came in at a significant juncture on your path. I honor her, I love her for it. I saw her afterwards, I came back to California, and 
periodically saw her, and it was always like that. It was always just home again. You know, thank you for seeing me. I see you, you see me. Great gift. So that's what I want to say. I had, I had this um, idea while I was watching it. You know how in the, back in the day, gay men would say, you're a friend of Dorothy, and it was like a secret code. I think we got, we're a friend of Sally's. <laughs> you just have to say that to anyone, and you know, you'll, you'll get a big circle of friends. <laughs> I love that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a, a thing, a write a thing about that, because every time I saw a friend of Sally's, I thought that ring could be so big. Um, but to your question, <laughs> um, you know, Audrey Lord talked about this, and I love that Sally, it's in, in Sally's uh, consciousness, about not ignoring our differences. I wish I, I'm not really good at remembering quotes, because Audrey had a lovely quote about it, and that Sally understood we're all going to be different from each other, that's the nature of humanity and one of the glories of humanity. Um, but in order to overcome our fears, too often we try to diminish those differences. Oh, yes, we're just like you, you know, the civil rights movement. You think of all those people dressing in suits and ties and the, I'll uh, never forget um, in Philadelphia, Barbara what's her name in the women's movement, and she was wearing that skirt, you know, the pic famous picture, and here's the big dyke in the skirt, demonstrating it, I'm thinking, oh, she looks so uncomfortable. <laughs> um, she was. And she was. Uh, but we had to prove we were just like everybody else, and I th that is our biggest error, because you can't really see people unless you can see who they are, the differences that make them who they are. It doesn't mean you're necessarily going to agree with them, but you will always find something to talk about. Uh, and I think that has been the key uh, for Sally in, in developing coalitions. Um, I mean, you know, I never met Harvey Milk, uh, someone who I admire in, in retrospect, but I can't imagine he was the easiest guy in the world to be working with. You know, um, but she was able to work with him because she recognized his value and recognized what he was about and how he was different from her. And that is really, for me, the most important lesson uh, about thinking about working across the aisle, being able to see the differences uh, and figure out what you have in common that you both could use to move things forward. Sometimes it won't be that easy. I can think of names I could say right now, but I won't because you all know who they are, uh, that I will not find much in common with. Um, but I think that is going to be the key because as we go forward, we have to make coalitions because the bad people are bigger and have bigger guns than we do. So. Can I just say one? Just that last point was really good. Like when she talked about, when the woman said, uh, uh, about what they had in common, the, the one that she, you know, like, and that, that she could under, she said, well, now, then you have to understand, they really believe in what they believe in. And I thought, thank you. It's like all of, we forget that all the time, that other people, you know, all of that. I just thought it's a delicate thing that she was able to perceive that in people and respect it. And once you got that going, anything is possible. You can disagree, but you're ultimately respected and not in any kind of just, okay way, but in a profound way of saying, and I think that's because of her own background, that the, that the rigidity of her own background, that was it. Go ahead, I'm sorry. I just want to add one quick thing about Marge in the film, um, that, uh, what was the book that Marge gave her? Oh, uh, uh, autobiography. I think she gave her, uh, so Margie Handley, uh, is S Sally's friend who's staunch Republican, you know, rancher, family, et cetera. And she gave Sally, I think it was the biography of Ronald Reagan. When we went to film her, she had a big signed picture of Ronald Reagan in her house. 
And and Sal and she wanted Sally to read it. And Sally gave her something about lesbians, I think, and and asked her to read it. And and so she said she would, if but only if Sally would read the biography of Ronald Reagan. So Sally took it and said she would only read it while on the toilet. I think that she crossed the aisle but didn't cross over to the other side. <laughs> um, I'm just going to do a time check. Do we have time to show we have one more clip that's just two minutes that is on the wander ground? And then I have a question about the wander ground. So I'm just checking, Kevin, do we have time for that? Yeah. Yes. OK. So let's go to our next clip. So this is the last clip. It's a, just a short clip about the wander ground, which we are um, um, haven't fully animated yet, but we're taking small portions of the an of the wander ground and. and, and um, so I, we're we're so lucky to have such uh, you know prominent and accomplished writers um, in this panel that I I really wanted to show that clip and and ask the question that what is the role of stories, whether you're writing an essay, whether you're writing a play, poetry, you know, a fantasy novel, um, or, or making a film, what is the role of stories in movements for social change? Um, and and uh, maybe, Jewel, you can start, start us out. Um, I, wanna, I wanna quote something from Wanderground, because I, I looked it up because I remember when I first read it, it gave me permission to think about writing speculative fiction. Uh, she and Joanna Russ really just launched me into that idea. So, but the Wanderground is, is not one of those fluffy, you know, lesbians all romping through the fields of daisies never getting bitten by mosquitoes. Um, it was a really intense work. I mean, it still is. So I went back because I remembered being a little bit shocked because I was thinking about fluffy lesbians. Um, and one of her characters uh, who, who lives in the woman's land says, my enemy by definition cannot receive my love. My enemy by definition is the one I kill. It is not in his nature not to rape. It is not in my nature to be raped. We do not coexist. And what was important to me was, she was looking at the issues that women are facing very realistically, very hard edged. And it meant that what she was gonna try to create in that story was gonna really be relevant to the women who were reading it. It wasn't gonna be some thing that exists on some plane up here, pink, cloudy, marshmallowy. Um, but it was going to, to re grow out of the blood that women have shed in order to survive. And uh, the stories of how we survive, how we surpass, are needed in order for us to do anything to go into the future. And I mean, I think that's one of the reasons you see a lot of books being reprinted. The understanding, we need those stories. They didn't just come out and they're done. Um, a, a lot more presses are doing vintage imprints so that they can bring back some of the feminist books that were important to us. Uh, because those stories are the, uh, I don't know, kind of the magic carpet that we can use to get up and look over the landscape while we make social change, I think. Well, yeah, stories is everything. It's just, uh, you know, I was, I was, thank you for saying the thing about um, these reprints and vintage, et cetera, partly, and you know, I do, I still teach, and um, I, my students are, um, at this point, lar mostly, uh, largely Latino and, um, and other folks of color. And the, 
the ones that come in, that are particularly if they're first generation, they don't even know what to read, you know? And so all these, you know, it's like we forget because we have 40 years of reading and what were the works that impacted our lives, right? And so suddenly, these older books, it's like there is, I have to say, I really feel like there's been a giant sort of jump ahead without having done the homework of what was established before. And that's why they're being reprinted and that's why these uh, newer generations really do need the work. I am surprised how much they need the work, how new it is to them. I mean, they can say intersectionality like it's pouring out of their mouth, just like that. <laughs> and they have no idea what it means. They have no idea how hard it is to win that position. And even them with their bodies right there need it. And they can say it and they got all the theory and you know. But what was beautiful about those early works is that they were based first and foremost in praxis. And so when you have a fantasy like Wonderground, and she says, I think we're doing it, right? And she says, I think we're doing it. So it is a lit, and it's kind of like really, and I think this has to, to do so much with the relationship to activism, which Sally had, is that if you're actively involved and you are a writer, your story, your story is changing and evolving as you go for that very reason, right? So you're saying, am I living up to my dream? Or am I living up to my critique? You know, I'm not, one, I'm not a very good fantasy writer, except I wrote a dystopia. <laughs> <laughs> what does that tell you, right? But 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 I'm saying, but it is it it, it is the uh, it's the the bar is always being raised, and it's some what you're really saying the bar is really lowering. You're going deeper and deeper, and the beauty of Wanderground is that it is a realiza it is in many ways both the realization and the dream that that Sally you know has offered for the world and the, the books that followed as well, but particularly that text. I just want to say quickly that Sally, um, I mean, I think you're proving her wrong, but there was a moment that she and I had a discussion and she said, I think I'm going to have to burn everything I've written every 10 years. And I was like, oh, really? What, if, what about Wonderground? And she said, there's no sex in Wonderground. That was a big mistake. <laughs> <laughs> she should she should have put an addendum. <laughs> well, actually, if you read Sally, most people just know the Wanderground, but Sally wrote other right. fantasy novels, The Conchu and The Magister, and I think was writing, you know, working on a big trilogy in the last years of her life. And so I I'm I'm not a fantasy novel person. I can just never remember all those names. It's like reading a Russian novel. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I you know I have read the Conchu and men are only 10% of the population in the future. <laughs> and and there's a lot of sex. So there you go. Well, she did um, write a sequel. <laughs> um, I think we're doing pretty okay time wise. Um, I, you know, I had tried to leave about 20 minutes for Q&A when we're down to 10 now. So um, I think, um, Kevin, unless, um, um, do, do we have time for, you know, 10, 15 minutes of Q&A, do you think? Um, okay, so we're open for, open for business if people have questions. Sharon. Sharon. They're, they're bringing you up. All right. Thank you very much. OK. Uh, thank you for gathering this group together. Um, I want to mention, so I, I got comments for a couple of people and some thoughts for you about things that I would like to see you change in your film. Not change, but things that I would like to see you, because it's <laughs> in progress. So. I'm accustomed to working, showing things that are in progress, and you get feedback about what's working and what you'd like to see more of. Um, I want to thank um, Jewel for talking about the, uh, the idea about going forward. I think one of the questions in working with allies is, 
with allegiances and, and across the lines is how do we agree on what, which way is forward. I think that can be a real sticking point. Mm -hmm. So that's a thought for all of us. Um, Cherie, I appreciate you talking about Sally being butch and, you know, making that um, present. Um, and you talked about her background and the importance of her background. And I would like to see some more of that in the film. And I don't know, I'm sure you have some of it and we just saw little clips, but I feel like that's really important yeah. um, to talk yeah. about that background, where she grew up, the skills that she learned there, um, how she reacted and responded to those and how she carried the skills forward in the work that she did in the lesbian feminist community and in politics in general. Yes, great point. We, we're working on that. Okay, so i glad to hear it. Um, and Cherie, your uh, statement about her being a little too much, I think that is, and Jewel, you picked up on that too, I feel like that's really an important insight. I would also say um, the, the comment about the nudity um, and the complicatedness, I feel like it can, it felt like there was enough nudity that it was distracting from, that the sensationalism of it um, distracted from the importance of the work. So I would consider how many of those images you use and how frequently you use them and how you use them. Um, and I think that is everything for me. Thank you, I'm really glad to see this work and uh, you know, thank you. Thanks so much for your thoughts, yeah. Somebody over there. There's somebody else, okay. Go for it. You need the mic. Mic. I was really struck by my work in my Speaking or public speaking is hard enough for me. Um, the importance of both separatism and reaching across the aisle and what you had to say, Jewel, about those happening in that orbit. Mm -hmm. And being a member of the enemy, I really appreciate and want to think of ways that's to happen. That can happen, especially you know, from other levels today. I, I don't know if it's more of a feeling or a fantasy, just find myself picturing the potential role of story and metaphor and symbolism in that, in bringing opposing viewpoints together, especially in a world where we perceive the not listening and no possibility of communication happening. I just would love to see us sneak that in there in a science fiction, mm. fantasy, novel, movie that has important, clear, true messages, but they're, they're underneath. And maybe we can't say, oh, that's their thing. Thank you. Mm. When we go on, there was somebody over here. I don't know where before. There, okay. The microphone. Where was she born and what year did she die? Uh, she was born in Virginia in 1931 and she died in 2021. Hi there, uh, beautifully done, uh, short clips. It's so interesting to see the process of film and the fact that you're willing to be vulnerable enough to share it with us uh, is really great. I think one of the things that was so moving to me in addition to hearing everybody, of course if I didn't say that, no. Hmm. But, uh, <laughs> uh -huh. 
But really, seriously, one of the things that was so moving to me is that seeing film, and we were in such a visual culture at this point, that even storytelling is visual, uh, is that this is a film about Sally, but it's about so many others, and so, you know, the folks who are here right now, and that's so important, and I so appreciate that you know, in the future, when we get to see this, and in the future beyond that, when others get to see it, uh, though hopefully their interest and their imagination will be piqued and find out more about so many women. So by doing a film about one, you're doing a film about so many. And I think uh, the little bit that I knew of Sally, that would have really appealed to her. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Thank you. That's such a such a, a great comment. We really, really want to make sure not to just show Sally as this icon up in the clouds, but to show her in the community and interdependent and really working with other women and influencing other women and being influenced by other women. Keep those nude pictures, yes. <laughs> so on that subject, I just have a quick question. The whole movie footage is really quite amazing. And I'm curious where you got that and where that resides now and how, how much there is apart from what you've used. Do you know much about that? Or like, should I just say what I know? Um, so um, um, there was, you know, we don't know if she was topless or not, the woman behind the camera. <laughs> Maybe. But um, there were several women who were on the land regularly that filmed a lot. And one woman who both filmed and did a lot to ensure that footage was saved was a woman named Carla Bloomberg, who was Sally's f friend from back in Texas. And then another woman, Dorothy Hacker, who we interviewed for, the, we interviewed Carla for the film, and we interviewed Dorothy Hacker uh, for the film, and both of them met Sally back in Texas. And both of them were never a long term on the land, but were up there sometimes filming. And, and very, very fortunately, um, a lot of that footage is available to us either through Sally's archives at the University of Oregon and Eugene or um, directly through Carla Bloomberg. So, you know, just a plug for archives, those of you who have photos, footage, et cetera, make sure that it ends up in an archive somewhere. Uh, let me check if some of, the, I, I don't know if any of this is not yet in an archive, but I'll double check to find out, but thanks for the tip. Back there in the plaid. <laughs> oh. Of course. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. How can we help you finish this wonderful <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm not a, the most top-notch fundraiser, so I forgot to say earlier there are postcards in the back. We always need funding. We've gotten fund grants, etc. Um, we've been working, uh, me and Jorgen and Dean, who are here, have been working for free for five years on this project because there's not oodles of funding for gay and lesbian projects. For some reason, Hollywood doesn't come banging down the door when you're doing a film about a lesbian separatist who traipses around the wood topless. Um, so there's a postcard on the table as you walk in the door. It has uh, a short description of our film. It has a website on it. It has a QR code on it. And uh, donations of any amount are extremely welcome. We've gotten a few larger donations from folks, which are very, very helpful. We get many, many, many donations of $25, $50, $100, and those all are very, very helpful. Um, and we've also been doing house parties um, locally and uh, p potentially <clears throat> we might do some in Los Angeles um, uh, that have been really, really fruitful both in terms of raising money and just raising awareness about the film and getting us some feedback about the film in, pro uh, in progress. So any and all of those things uh, are really, really helpful. Don't feel daunted if you only have $25 to give. We really, really appreciate. And if you have, and, you know, I'm channeling my partner here. She just would get up and say, just 
cough up a couple thousand dollars, you know. <laughs> Uh, you know, if you have money or know people who have money, um, we are going to make it to the finish line, but it, it's, um, and we're getting there, but it's a lot of hard work and, and it does take money. So thank you so much for that question. I just want to thank Deborah and um, Undine and York. You want to raise your hands at least so people can back there. We're working so hard on this film and really, you know, making it happen. So, yeah, did you have one more thing? One more. Deborah, uh, Tracy, Gary, uh, if you will say how much the film is costing and, and where you are and when you hope to get it. Done. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Tracy. I, I, I'm usually scared to talk about money because I think people will freak out. Our budget is about $600,000, um, and um, we've raised about half of that. Uh, miraculously, um, and so um, you know, I've, Tracy's been gracious enough to to give me some advice. So, if again, if any of you have thoughts about uh, people who might be able to donate more significant amounts, um, and do a house party, it's, uh, and or do a house party, um, please check in with us. Contact information is on um, the postcard. You can come just find me or you're gonna, Andine are, are there in the back. So, so we are gonna make it. I know some people worry about funding little films that don't end up crossing the finish line. We're absolutely gonna cross the finish line. Um, we hope we're not crawling across it. <laughs> no, we'll be trotting across the finish line. We might not be, you know, doing a five-minute mile. But, uh, but thank you. That's a great question. But we'll have a house party line right here. Those of you who are going to do house parties, okay? Yes. Yes. Thank you, Tracy. Yeah. And thanks to the San Francisco Public Library also for their. <laughs> Um, support and patience and for uh, really, uh, you know, support of the queer slash LGBTQ slash all of the letters in the alphabet uh, community. Um, it, 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 in, in these times, you know, these trying, trying times, we feel uh, so, so lucky to live in a place like this where we are welcome and supported. Thank you all for coming. This is such a wonderful collection of amazing people. So thank you all for being here.